say all hell's broken loose in downtown Seattle as the May Day march and demonstration turned violent. Windows being smashed, massive crowds in downtown Seattle. Things are heating up as protesters converge on downtown streets. Como's Hannah Scott is live with details. As we got to Seneca and 4th Avenue here at this Wells Fargo, someone tossed something in through the window. The entire front window of this Wells Fargo is smashed. Do you want to say why you broke the window? I won't use your name. Sure, because the force system hasn't done anything for anyone, ever. It's just another system of control. It's just another way to keep us down, keep us from expressing our free will, expressing our free ideas. They sent us to sit in jail for petty-ass crime. Some of the folks in the march are upset you guys broke windows, so you kind of messed up their chi. What do you say? Listen, you do your own thing, and I do my own thing. We're all in the same boat. We're all trying to bring change. You don't have to be violent. Please get that shit out of my face. Please get that shit out of my face. Sorry. Please get that shit out of my face. No pictures. Right now, I want to get to Como's Ian Sterling, who is also downtown from a different perspective covering things. Ian, what can you fill us in with? Well, guys, here at the federal courthouse, just as I pulled up, dozens, and I mean dozens, of Homeland Security SUVs zoomed up. Uh, People jumped out. There's U.S. Marshals out in front here. I hear them talking about securing the front of this courthouse so that nobody can gain access by breaking the big, you know, plate glass windows that are out front here. Uh, There's guys with assault rifles, a lot of guys dressed in uh, riot gear with what looks to be uh, guns capable of firing tear gas grenades, that type of stuff. So a massive security presence at the U.S. Federal Courthouse in downtown Seattle. Corey in Seattle who says he was in the march. What can you tell us, Corey? We walked around the back side of uh, the old courthouse and we saw about a dozen, maybe 15 or so folks just jumping up in there, smashing windows, and there's paint everywhere. And they threw like a smoke bomb or a tear gas bomb of some kind because we could feel the irritants in our throats as we were walking out of there. Como's Joel Moreno. In fact, Joel, didn't you get hit with something? Yeah, Ken, unfortunately I did. Uh, we followed the march uh, that, that was started at Westlake. A uh, pretty large group, a couple hundred people, wanted to march through the streets. We just started getting pelted with uh, paint bombs. From there, it just escalated. Uh uh, I guess rocks came out next, storefronts uh, started getting smashed. And now joining us live on the Como Newsline is Tom Glasgow. Tom, you're down in the thick of it. What's going on? Sorry about some of the language you may be hearing uh, in the background. As the police are now trying to uh, disperse this crowd, batons are being used right now, pushing one of the protesters back. So this could turn into a, a very uh, ugly situation. Now we've got uh, either a pepper spray being I use on one of the protesters who is now holding his uh, arms out. Well, someone who wasn't wearing uh, a tear gas mask today was John DiCeplo. We got a little taste of that tear gas this afternoon covering the story. And John is joining us live now on the Como Newsline. How you doing? Oh, Dan, i got to be honest with you. That stuff actually works, and it works really well. It's got me dead in my tracks. We were actually at the corner of First and Pike. When it looked like an officer was trying to remove one of those flags that we had talked about from one of the protesters, the protester pushed the officer back, and as soon as he did, he did that, all heck broke loose. Officers grabbed that person, arrested him. When they did so, every protester jumped in to try and save that one protester, and when that happened, I turned around, and I, I kid you not, I saw at least 10 officers drop their shields, batons came out, and all heck broke loose in a matter of two seconds. Things escalated very, very quickly. Good morning. It is 1131 breaking news here at Como News Radio. I'm Nancy Barrick. We've got a shooting in Seattle's Roosevelt neighborhood. We're just learning that two people have been killed. We have multiple victims. Como's Ian Sterling joins us live with the latest. Nancy, this is happening at a cafe at Roosevelt and 58th Street here. And believe me, it is a very active scene. There are helicopters overhead driving here. I was passed by a number of police vehicles and fire trucks. The police have an area, I'd say we're probably three blocks away from this actual cafe right now. It's locked down while they look for whoever may have done the shooting. We're being told that possibly up to five people have been shot there. Of course, we'll have much more on this story as it develops. Reporting live, Ian Sterling, Como News Radio. And we've got Como's Corwin Hake live at Harborview Medical Center. One medic, one aid car has arrived here under police escort, and we're certainly expecting more. Harborview Medical Center is certainly the premier trauma center in the Northwest. They're well experienced with gunshot wounds. The victims, as they arrive, will go into immediate treatment here. And now I'm seeing a second medical car arrive, perhaps with the second victim in this shooting. Of course, more details to come live at Harborview, Corwin Hake, Coleman News Radio.
And uh, Roosevelt High School, close to where the shooting occurred, it is now under lockdown. Roosevelt High School has been placed in lockdown as a precaution uh, because of the shooting that happened uh, this morning. So we have another shooting to report, Nancy Barrett. Just a, uh, a crazy morning here in Seattle. We've gotten word of another shooting at 8th and Seneca. This, according to a tweet coming from Seattle Police. Just had a chance to talk just real briefly with a woman who said she witnessed what happened, that she said that she saw uh, a, a, a person standing over a woman on the ground that was actually kicking her and then pulled out a gun and shot her. But uh, I'm going to stay here and try to get more information from police and from other people who have, have, have seen this happen. Now, Owen works and lives in the area and was around there at the time of the shooting. I was actually walking down a couple blocks over, and that's when I first heard uh, all the sirens and cop cars. I actually live on the back side of the alley, and uh, as I approached, it was clear that they blocked off all of Roosevelt and Ravenna corners, and I kind of got trapped in the middle of all this, the crime scene tape here. Now we're going to talk with uh, Nick Metz, Deputy Police Chief. Our homicide unit is here. They are taking command of the scene. Uh, we have our canine en route as well. So we have a lot of people out right now uh, searching for this individual. Uh, we're, we want to let neighbors know that we're doing everything that we can to find this person. Right now we're going to go to Marina Rockinger, who is at the uh, Cafe Racer. I mean, as you can imagine, police cars everywhere, yellow police tape everywhere, uh, very quiet tree-lined streets. It's uh, definitely not an area that you would even picture something like this happening. Como's Joel Marino. There have been teams of officers going house by house through those neighborhoods Checking to see if somebody is hiding somewhere in there. We went outside to see what was going on, and we looked down the street, um, and we heard a gunshot. And then a woman came running up the street um, telling us to get back in our building because there was a gunman. Pugil tells Como News that this is actually the suspect in the Roosevelt shooting. A self-inflicted gun, uh, gunshot wound is what we're understanding. Tom Glasgow is in West Seattle now with Seattle Police. Tom, bring us up to date. Let's go. We're with uh, Officer Nick Metz. Suspect saw that uh, he was just about to be captured, and the suspect then raised a firearm to his head and then uh, uh, shot himself in the head. My homicide detectives have informed me that they feel very confident that the individual involved in the shooting in the 5900 block of Roosevelt uh, Northeast is the same shooter as the one at 8th and Seneca. The father of Ian Stowicki, the shooter. Walt Stowicki joins me now on Como News Radio. Mr. Stowicki, thank you for being here. <sighs> sort of uh, relieved to be here. Relieved to be here, sir? Relieved to be here, yeah. How is that? Well, I don't want to hide. I don't want to be uh, perceived as any of the family of being perceived as uh, not partaking of the grief of all the people, all six. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss and what you're going through, but there are some obvious questions waiting to be answered uh, here, Mr. Stowicki. Did you really see this coming? No, not like this. We never thought that he would uh, go cold like this and uh, turn into a killer. The woman who rushed to give CPR to uh, Gloria Leonidas at 8th and Seneca. This is a Bellevue wife and mom. She was either getting into her car or parking her car yesterday when she meets up with Ian Stowicki. So I'm waiting at the light and I heard someone hollering, help me, help me, and I look to my left and a man is kicking someone in the parking lot and eventually pulled out a gun and fires one shot. I can hear her hollering, help me, help me. It's one of the most dangerous warnings the National Weather Service can issue. So we have ice storm warning up to a quarter inch of rain. The freezing rain is into Seattle. And the ice has brought SeaTac to a halt. In fact, Carlene Johnson, I believe, is ready to go with Sharla at SeaTac Airport. Carlene? Good morning, Mandy. Yeah, I am just arriving at SeaTac Airport. I see lots of cars still coming up the airport drive. I don't know if these folks have heard the bad news. Let's get right to Sharla Skaggs. Well, the good news is we're estimating that the runways will open in 15 to 20 minutes. Unfortunately, the taxiways themselves remain very icy and treacherous.
Thank you, Charlotte. And I'm just headed inside. I'll get a reaction from passengers to this grim news here at SeaTac, all as a result of our snow and ice. Phil and Amanda? Well, you know, if it is too uh, slick at SeaTac, it's also going to be too slick on the highways. And that is where the State Department of Transportation comes in. Chris Olson is with the DOT. We are closing down. State Route 18 between I-90 and Issaquah Hobart Road immediately because there are too many trees coming down across the road. It's too icy out there, and we need to wait until daylight so we can safely get out there and see what's going on. Como AAA traffic and weather every 10 minutes on the fours. And Paul Tosh can put this in a little more perspective and get some details on what it's like out there right now. We've got sections of 410 shut down with trees down across the road. Uh, you know, it, it, have, have we told you enough? If you do not have to be out here, I uh, don't. I recognize some of you are still going to brave it. You've got to get you got to get to where you need to be this morning. I understand that attitude, but be very, very careful. Several lanes of I-5 still shut down northbound in Linwood. And I-5 in Tumwater is still completely closed at 93rd. Paul Tosh for the Gumbo Air Patrol. Aldiano has the outlook weather-wise. Yesterday, it was all about the snow. Today, it is all about the ice. We have widespread freezing rain. Rain that's just freezing on everything it touches when it hits the ground, including road surfaces and the sidewalks outside of your house. It will be very slippery for the next several hours. Freezing rain all around the Puget Sound area this morning. Downtown Seattle right now, yes, it is coming down, and it's 28. Como News Time 607. Well, a tow crew will inflate giant airbags as they're trying to lift a rolled over semi out of a ditch on I 5. And that's where we find Como's Corwin Hake watching the action in Linwood. Still, this big rig skidded off the freeway around 2 this morning and landed in the ditch. The driver is okay, but the entire rig is on its left side at an awkward angle. There's a giant Class C tow truck with its tow bar raised high in the air and cables wrapped around the trailer and the cab. And now with uh, conditions on Capitol Hill in Seattle, Como's John Rep standing by, John. Well, Corwin, sleet, rain, freezing rain continues to fall as drivers are, are struggling uh, to figure out exactly how they can get around today in downtown Seattle. Anthony's out driving a restaurant delivery truck this morning. He says yesterday it was the snow. Ah, um, now it's the ice, I guess. Yeah. I didn't even notice. I heard it, my chains, could, look, you could, as you can see, they... They, kept, they were coming off. Luckily, I pulled over, so they didn't. nobody got hurt. I'm seeing a lot of chains uh, discarded on the side of the road. Now, with all of that said, conditions here in Seattle, yes, they're going to be icy, but they're probably better than what you're running into to the south of the city. I've actually been walking on some of these hills, venturing out a little bit onto the roadway just to see how slick they are. And, and from what I saw, there's a little bit more traction than what I thought there would be on some of the hills in downtown Seattle. Panic at a mall outside Portland. A man dressed in a white hockey mask opening fire in the food court. Como's Ian Sterling joining us live with the latest. Ian? Police say they have neutralized the gunman and that at least one person is dead at Clackamas Town Center. Witnesses tell our sister station K2 in Portland that multiple people were shot. Nick works at the popular shopping center. It was pretty hectic and everybody was running out of the mall. He remains locked in the back storage room of the store where he works as police go door to door to make sure there is not a second or third shooter. Reporter Megan Kalkstein from our sister station K2 in Portland also is on the scene with what witnesses heard and saw. I did talk to an employee at the Cinnabon who talked about hearing 15 to 20 shots. She says she was just wide out in the open uh, trying to stock the shelves and so she and all the other employees just dropped the ground immediately. Just a terrifying scene. Couple force John Humber has the very latest. A deadly scene in what was described as pure chaos at the Clackamas Town Center Mall in southeast Portland this afternoon. The Clackamas County Sheriff's Office says three people are dead. That includes a lone gunman who died of a self-inflicted wound. So many questions remain this morning about the mall shooting in the Portland area. Police are still working to find answers. We continue our coverage with Como's John Rep now live at Clackamas Town Center. While I'm looking across the parking lot at the Macy's right about where the shooting took place, police still have the entire mall blocked off and it will not reopen today after a man wearing a bulletproof vest and a hockey mask walked into the crowded food court. People started hiding behind counters and um, eventually everybody went to the middle of Sears. Now, thousands of people who ran to safety couldn't believe that this was all taking place, even police. These things aren't supposed to happen. Como's Carleen Johnson has some more perspective on this. ABC's crime and terrorism expert Brad Garrett tells Como there are common threads connecting shootings like this and a reason why these guys target places like malls and movie theaters. A large body of people who are not, by and large, going to be armed 
uh, and that they can ultimately take the the control of just the average citizen. We're hearing he is likely in his late teens or early 20s. Garrett says mental state for someone who would do this is likely... Angry, disillusioned, feels like he's been wronged by society. Likely written online about being depressed or wanting to act out, too. Carlene Johnson Como, News Radio. There have been shootings at malls here. You'll remember 2005 in Tacoma. 911, are you at the mall? Yes, I am, and I've already shot several people. I want three hostages. Dominic Maldonado, he wounded seven people in all, sentenced to 163 years in prison. In 2008, Barry Saunders shot and killed one teenager and wounded another at South Center. Just a little over an hour from now, President Barack Obama on the final night of the Democratic National Convention will give his acceptance speech. Our own John Rep is live at the Time Warner Cable Arena in Charlotte. The energy level is building with every performance and every speech, but a lot rests on the president tonight. This advice from the the Cedro Woolley delegate. Be himself as he has been. He has so much charisma and um, (laughs) he just has to be real. Well, thousands of delegates look forward to tonight's Republican National Convention program in Tampa, while a much smaller crowd of protesters plans a response. Complete coverage continues now with Como's John Rep live in Tampa to tell us about life outside the convention perimeter. Yeah, they were hoping for bigger crowds at Romneyville. That is the city's protest encampment where a guy named Vermin Supreme, no, really, that's his real name, offers sound bites as a satirical political candidate. So this electioneer, vote early and vote often. Remember, a vote for me, Vermin Supreme, is a vote completely thrown away. Thank you. Good evening once again, along with Jane Shannon. I'm Tom Hutler, and so far this election has certainly lived up to its billing as one wild ride. If you're a Democrat, the main event is now underway at the Westin in downtown Seattle. That's where we find Como's Ian Sterling joining us live. Ian? There are no fewer than 25 election parties happening in this hotel. The big is right here in the Grand Ballroom. Gubernatorial candidate Jay Inslee is now in the building and will also be at this event. His opponent, Rob McKenna, at a Republican function on the east side. That's where we find Como's John Rep, who continues our live team coverage. The room went from electric to deflated in a matter of minutes, or uh, just about a half an hour ago with the presidential race, as you heard. Of course, it's been called for uh, President Barack Obama. The people here say a Republican in the governor's mansion would be more than just a consolation prize. And a big decision just made here in the state of Washington, where we have voted to legalize the recreational use of marijuana. Como's Hannah Scott joins us live now with very late on Initiative 502. The Associated Press now saying that Initiative 502, which would legalize an ounce or less of marijuana for everybody 21 and over in our state, has passed. We are the first state in the nation to legalize the recreational use of pot despite a federal ban on the drug. Same-sex couples who want to be legally married are holding out hope that voters will ultimately approve R-74. Como's Corwin Hake joins us from the West End downtown. One such couple are Pierce and Maureen, who say they've been together for 16 years and have been part of commitment ceremonies in several states and Canada. Now they say it's time for their home to recognize their union. We have kids now in this home state, and we wanted to do everything possible to make it legal here in Washington. Como's Charlie Harger live at the Reject R-74 headquarters. He said there's optimism tonight. Tom, Preserve Marriage Washington's Chip White says this is a tight race. So while we don't know the final results and we might have to wait a while until we do, I can say that I am very proud of the campaign that all of us have run. White says momentum is on his side and that Washington should not allow gays the right to marry. Let's turn again to the governor's race. It is going to be a while, as we've discussed, before we're going to know who wins this thing, correct? Yeah, it would be nicer and it would be simpler if we could have a results by election night. But here's the other part. Washington state is probably going to have the highest voting turnout in the country. That's huge. That is huge. And we are going to we are going to see that I, I think more and more over the next few years as other states begin to look at that as as a model, looking at Washington and Oregon, and also the Oregon model of basically. I mean, their results are available tonight. Back to the election returns, and in the state's most expensive attorney general's race ever, Democrat Bob Ferguson has a sizable lead over Reagan Dunn this morning. But Como's Carlene Johnson is here to tell us a different story that Dunn has something big to celebrate anyway. As of late Tuesday night, Ferguson's lead over Dunn was. 50- 53 to 47 percent. The Democrat, though, not quite ready to declare victory. It's looking like it'll go that way, though. It may be a little too early, but the results look very, very promising. And I... Uh, Como 
TV was actually interviewing Reagan Dunn last night at the Republican Party in Bellevue when his wife interrupted for good reason. I ran mostly a positive set of ads for mine as well, so I was proud of that. I'm so sorry. I'm having contractions. We're going to go. Yeah, she said, I'm having contractions. And he said, yeah, just give me a sec. No word on baby done yet this morning. Carlene Johnson, Como News Radio. It is a very sad day for all of us here at Como. We've lost an extremely dear friend and colleague, Kathy Gertson. As our general manager, Jim Clayton, put it when he addressed the staff a little while ago, a very bright light has gone out in all of our lives. Kathy passed away surrounded by her family after a long and courageous battle with recurring brain tumors. We have so much to share today about Kathy. We'll start with Como's Corwin Hake. Kathy was Seattle through and through. Good afternoon, I'm Kathy Gertson with a special Como 4 News Brief. Born here in 1958, a Queen Anne High grad. We will continue to monitor this situation. Kathy was the state of Washington. I'm tough. I'm a cougar. A graduate of Washington State University's Edward R. Murrow School of Communication. And Kathy was Como, a comet of a newscaster who became a reporter here in 1980. From local grocery stores for cyanide testing, we'll have the results. A weekend anchor by 82, and in 1984, assumed the chair she would occupy for the next quarter century. Tonight at 5, we'll tell you if you're going to have... Co-anchor of the Como 4 Evening News. And there she remained, an authoritative voice, a trusted journalist. It's an ancient medical treatment that's the focus of a special report I have coming up A source up of warmth and stability in a sometimes chilly, unstable world. Avalanche dangers are keeping Snoqualmie Pass closed tonight and forcing thousands of drivers to just wait it out. She stepped away from that role briefly when her daughter Alexa was born in 1989 and again when she welcomed Andrea in 1995. But she always came back. We always had Kathy with us and felt we always would. One day in late 1998, we learned Kathy was ill. She suffered from a non-cancerous brain tumor called a meningioma. Called a meningioma. It's the fourth time I've had this surgery in 10 years. Throughout the years, so the as she fought the tumor, the outpouring of viewer support reminded us, her Como family, it wasn't just us who loved Kathy. There are now more than 51,000 fans of this Facebook page to let Kathy know they are with her in this battle, right here with her. And Kathy's unflagging good spirits a astonished her friends, her co-workers, and her many thousands of fans and viewers. I'm still Kathy. I'm still me. My face is different, but it's me, and I'm, I'm fine. Kathy returned to the air as often as she could. This is a great day here at Como to have Kathy at my side again at the anchor desk. Until, for the sake of her viewers, she felt she could not. I, you know, my mouth isn't working right. I, it, it wouldn't be fair for the viewer to try to understand the news every day. Kathy earned five Emmys and a Murrow Award during her distinguished career. Oh, I don't take anything for granted. I, every last night I watched the moon set and this morning I saw the mountains with snow and clear and I don't take ever take that for granted. One moment. Corwin Hake, Como News Radio. A Washington state trooper is dead, shot and killed during a traffic stop near Port Orchard very early this morning. The search is on for the shooter. A live update from the scene from Como's Carlene Johnson. Bill, the shooting happened here along Highway 16 near Port Orchard about 1 this morning. Trooper stopped a dark green truck, radioed in the license number. That officer didn't check back with headquarters, and after several minutes, they sent a deputy out to check on him, found him down next to his patrol car, shot rushed to the hospital where he died. The Pierce County Medical Examiner's Office procession has now ended. The body has been transported inside of the building. There's still an enormous presence. Many, many state patrol troopers and other law enforcement uh, showing up in, in respect. And we may not know the name of this trooper who was shot and killed, but we are learning a lot more about the person he was. Here's how Chief John Batiste described him just minutes ago. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, he is a very popular individual within the agency, uh, a great personality. I love being around him, uh, a real sense of humor, uh, a person who was highly thought of uh, in the community. The search for the man who shot and killed a state trooper this morning near Port Orchard may be over. The latest developments now from Como's Carlene Johnson. Good morning, Nancy. Here's the very latest. Authorities got a tip a little less than an hour ago about a home on Schofield Road near Mullinex Ridge Elementary School. Well, the school was put into total lockdown as officers then moved in. As the SWAT team approached the house, 
they heard a single gunshot come from the area of the house. Uh, when they reacted to that and approached the house, they found a male subject um, who had a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And we are just getting confirmation that this suspect at Tacoma General Hospital has died. 44-year-old Tony Radulescu was gunned down very early this morning during a traffic stop. It happened near Gorst in Kitsap County. He was originally from Romania, arriving in the U.S. at the age of 14. Tony Radulescu, serving in the military at Fort Lewis, has a son who now is also in the military. There is a growing memorial along on Highway 16, where the trooper was shot and killed. Como's Hannah Scott joins us live from the scene right now. In front of me, a white wooden cross that has the words Trooper Tony on it. Several dozen bouquets of flowers, American flags, small written, handwritten notes. Within the next few minutes, hundreds of law enforcement personnel who've gathered at Kitsap Mall in Silverdale will begin the memorial procession. We have team coverage this morning. First, Como's Carlene Johnson live. Boy, the people are lining up. Just folks from the community have come out here as the procession just right now, as I speak to you, begins to pull out from this parking lot at Kitsap Mall. The memorial for murdered state trooper Tony Radulescu is going on right now at Kent's Showwear Center. About 700 law enforcement and emergency vehicles with their lights flashing escorted the hearse carrying his body to the memorial. The procession started 7.30 this morning. At one point, the line of law enforcement vehicles extended some 12 miles on the way to Kent. And that is where we find Como's John Rapp. Well, from that long procession this morning that you mentioned to the solemn and respectful honor guard in front of the showwear center, this day has been filled with reminders of the life and death of Trooper Tony Radulescu. It is the hidden price of war for too many in the military, post-traumatic stress disorder. Studies warn that as many as six of every ten combat veterans suffer from PTSD. And our guys are left standing on the street corner because they can't get a job because they're not stable enough to maintain one because they didn't get the help that they needed. Como News Radio has spent months winning the trust of troops and their spouses to get them, in their own words, to talk about the pain of life with PTSD. Como's John Rep investigates. Go! Army Specialist Carlos sees it up close every time he falls asleep. An Iraqi fighter shot at close range. He's pulling the trigger, and he can't look away. Every morning, uh, I wake up with the same images. It, it's so difficult waking up knowing what you've done. Carlos isn't his real name. He's an active duty soldier, so we're concealing his identity. But everything else is very real. It's, it's like a bad dream every day. One of many young soldiers fighting an unseen battle with life after combat. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't I couldn't go and just go to go to a store. From depression to fear of public places to uncontrolled rage. One day I was driving I, I was just my anxiety level was just so high. He was officially diagnosed with PTSD last year. And I knew if I didn't go to the ER, I would just, I would have probably done some things that I would have regretted. He says treatment has helped a little, but getting that treatment isn't always easy for soldiers who say they're stigmatized and often put into situations where they're almost sure to fail. I think it just goes to, to show that, that sometimes the military is covering up stuff that they don't want the public to see. And now it's out there and now they're going to have to do something about it. Tim, a sergeant, blames a cost-conscious command. It doesn't surprise me that they're, they're doing this because it's a, a quick, easy way to get people kicked out of the military. They're tired of the silence. And this is the story of soldiers asked to fight for their country now fighting to get on with the rest of their lives. Everything everything comes with a price. John Rep, Como News Radio. So how does the command staff at Lewis McCord and Madigan Army Hospital respond? John has asked repeatedly for interviews each time they've turned him down. Politics and pot. Come on, Hannah Scott says that's what thousands of people are talking about along the waterfront as Hemp Fest kicks off in Seattle. Nearly 400 vendors selling glass pipes, hemp clothing, cookies, jewelry, and other weed-related goods, plus a half dozen stages for music and politics. We've had the same message every single year, which is, you know, 
People that just smoke marijuana or use marijuana are not criminals. Washington made history by legalizing marijuana. Initiative 502 will allow adults to have up to an ounce of pot. And Como Town and Scott says it also allows the state to tax and regulate the sales. The biggest opposition to 502 came from medical marijuana advocates who say the DUI provision in the measure will end up sending patients and just about anybody else who uses weed to jail. But Allison Holcomb with New Approach Washington, the group behind the legalization measure, says that's bogus. Initiative 502 doesn't change our medical marijuana law at all. President Obama weighing in on our state's newly passed law legalizing the recreational use of marijuana. Almost John Rep is live at the update desk with some clarification from the Commander-in-Chief. He says he doesn't support widespread legalization. However, President Obama does tell ABC's Barbara Walters that voters have spoken and that recreational users in Washington state should not be a top priority for federal law enforcement. Congressman Adam Smith uh, spoke with us earlier on this issue. Well, that's a contradiction that isn't fair you know, to your average person out there not knowing what's legal and what's not. So what, what we need to do on the federal level is we need to allow state law to control and take away the federal preemption. Now, the president also downplayed his own use of pot in high school, saying that he's done a bunch of things that he regrets as a kid. Same-sex marriage supporters in our state are celebrating President Obama's support of gay marriage. Como's Hannah Scott has more. Josh Friedis with Equal Rights Washington says it's an historical moment comparing Obama's move to landmark decisions like Roe v. Wade and Brown v. Board of Education. And what was so powerful about what President Obama said today was he talked about his personal journey and he talked about how the stories and the conversations he had with friends and family and his staff changed his opinion. And while Friedis expects Obama's comments to push Washington voters to support same-sex marriage, opponents like Joseph Backholm with the Family Policy Institute say the opposite is true. I think this will help help mobilize people. Back home says Obama's comments are an effort to fundraise in an election year. Hannah Scott, Como News Radio. State Senator Ed Murray calls this an exciting and historic day. Murray, who is gay, says the president's public statement won't become a divisive campaign issue this fall because those who do not support same-sex marriage were not likely going to vote for Obama in the first place. Larry Rice, Como News Radio. And meantime, here in the state, they've gathered more than half the signatures needed for a referendum against gay marriage. The group Preserve Marriage Washington has until June 6th if they want to stop our state's new law allowing gay marriage. It goes into effect June 7th. If they get the 120,577 signatures needed, it'll put the law on hold until a vote in November. Preserve Marriage Washington believes marriage can only be the union of one man and one woman. Art Sanders, Como News Radio. Supporters of marriage equality are cheering the re-election of the president. President as well, Como's Corwin Hake live at the Yes on 74 get together. And apology in this crowded ballroom at the West who went for search when various networks began calling the race for Obama. And my colleague Charlie Harder is, is with the No on 74 camp and he joins us live. Charlie? Looking at some updated numbers, King County results have just started to trickle in. And what we're understanding is that the approval of R74 has actually taken the lead so far in early results. Cheryl Chow, well-respected Asian-American, former Seattle City Councilwoman and former member of the Seattle School Board. She's also dying of brain cancer and this week revealed publicly she's gay. Como's Hannah Scott got a chance to sit down with Chow to talk to her about her health and the decision to come out. Cheryl and her partner of 10 years, Sarah, welcomed me into their cozy Seward Park home. Cheryl, in a very weakened state, struggled to get to the sofa, but with Sarah's help, she was able to sit down next to me and explain why she had to reveal her sexuality before she died. 60 years I've been hiding this. The reason she kept that secret? Because of our culture, Mm -hmm. the Chinese culture. Because of my political standing in the community, because of my because of my mom. Cheryl worried about her mom's reaction, especially because in their culture, it wasn't even common to tell family you love them. My mom said, Cheryl, that's the way she talks. Mm-hmm. And I went back in her room and she said, I love you. An explosion and fire rocks a Pierce County neighborhood. Como's Ryan Harris joins us live with details. What we know right now is that roughly 12.30 this afternoon, so just about a half an hour ago, there was a loud explosion in this neighborhood. It's in an unincorporated area between Puyallup and Graham. They believe there is at least one male and two small 
children inside this home. We currently have a confirmation on two, what appear to be two young burn victims fatalities. And the chief also said uh, this home belongs to someone who's been in the news recently. Josh Powell, whose wife Susan Powell disappeared more than two years ago. An email to Josh's lawyer that appears to be a suicide note. Gary, that email sent about 10 minutes before the explosion says simply, quote, I'm I'm sorry, sorry. Goodbye. goodbye. Those were the words in an email that Josh Powell wrote to his attorney just minutes before he set fire to his home, killing himself and his two young sons. Comos Corwin Hake joins us now live. Bill, those boys ages 5 and 7 arrived at Powell's front door in Graham for a state-supervised visit. Powell, of course, the husband of missing Puyallup native Susan Powell, pulled the boys inside, locked the door. The state contract worker who delivered those boys immediately called 911. The fire station for Graham Fire is not far from here. They immediately responded. They were here quickly, Uh, they were here very efficiently, they immediately began working, but the house was involved already. Pierce County Sheriff Paul Pastor calls this development not frustrating, but heartbreaking, and it comes two years and two months after Susan Powell disappeared in Utah, so far without a trace. Josh Long has been the focus of that investigation. He's always denied involvement. Now we're joined by Como's Carlene Johnson. Uh, She's live just up the street from what's left of that home. Carlene? when they're keeping us a block or so up the street from that home or what's left of it. Neighbors who heard and felt the blast and several smaller ones after, say, insulation and other debris rained down like snow. The news traveled fast all the way to Salt Lake, where the family used to live. Debbie Caldwell heard about what happened almost immediately. She babysat the boys, Charlie and Braden, and was still close with them, coming here for a vigil just last month. Brayden kept saying, will you come back and see me? And I said, I would come back and see him. And the last thing he told me was he loved me. Meanwhile, Josh Powell's father, Stephen, is on suicide watch this morning. He's in jail, has been since last year, on charges of voyeurism and child pornography. Opening statements coming later this morning in the Pierce County trial for Stephen Powell, the father-in-law of missing mom, Susan Powell. 14 counts of voyeurism is the case for prosecutors to prove. His defense team hopes the jury will only consider that evidence at trial, nothing else they may have heard or read about the case. What we want here in this courtroom is a fair trial. Anybody not agree with that? The girls who had their pictures taken as they changed clothes or used the bathroom are now in their early teens. They were just 8 and 10 when Powell allegedly took those photos from the window of his home into theirs next door. The girls and their mother do on the stand today. Our top story, a jury today found Stephen Powell guilty of secretly taking photos of the young girls who live next door to him. Como's Ian Sterling joins us live now from the Pierce County Courthouse and reports prosecutors want Powell put away for a long time. Jane, the jury found Powell guilty of 14 counts of voyeurism. He'll be sentenced June 15th. Ten years is uh, a distinct possibility, but we were we are definitely going to seek an exceptional sentence in this case. Deputy Prosecutor Grant Boleyn, detective searching for evidence in the disappearance of Susan Cox Powell, Stephen's daughter-in-law, stumbled on thousands of images of the neighbor girls in Powell's house last year. Reaction to the guilty verdicts for Stephen Powell from Chuck Cox, the father of missing mother Susan Cox Powell. I'm relieved. I'm glad that Steve's off the off the streets, but I'm also uh, disappointed that Susan wasn't part of the voyeurism case because she was certainly a victim. The attorney for Susan's parents hopes that this guilty verdict in Stephen Powell's case will lead to some sort of a deal with prosecutors, with Powell exchanging information about Susan's disappearance in exchange for a possible lighter sentence. He may say now that he's seen the writing on the wall. I mean, as he walked out, you know, in cuffs today with uh, all the guilty counts and 14 felony counts of voyeurism, maybe he's going to say, maybe now I do want to say something. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd like to not, you know, have this potentially huge sentence. But attorney Ann Bremner says the most likely scenario is that Stephen Powell will remain silent. One person who has steadfastly stood by Stephen Powell is his daughter, Alina. Shortly after the verdict, she talked about how she has lost her sister-in-law, Susan, her brother, Josh, her nephews, and now her father. An unimaginably complicated, difficult situation. 
that even I have a hard time understanding sometimes. ComoNews.com's Travis Mayfield has been immersed in the protest today, and he never left his desk. Yeah, it's all digitally. because of social media. That's right. Fascinating. It is fascinating. The, the universe we live in just totally changed because of social media. I was watching one of the protesters themselves. They were providing a live video stream from their iPhone in the midst of um, the, the protests that are, are right outside of the Hard Rock Cafe. And one of the most talked about things in the social media realm, Hurricane Sandy. Travis Mayfield from ComoNews.com is here. Twitter, Facebook, they're going nuts with photos and video, uh, pictures all day long. Yeah, it actually kept crashing uh, TweetDeck. It is moving so fast, people are tweeting so quickly, you cannot even consume the information. Brian Calvert is out and about this morning collecting toys at the Fred Meyer in Issaquah. All kinds of toys already coming in on our Problem Solver Toy Drive. On a day like no other when we're thinking of children, I'm in the uh, Issaquah area at the Fred Meyer store, and of course we are seeing an outpouring of toy donations and money donations here. Sherry Preston, ABC News. This is the Como Morning News. It's 831 Friday. You've made it to Friday. It's the 20th of July. It's rainy in downtown Seattle and 60 right now. And you're in the middle of our nonstop coverage, or continuing coverage of the awful developments in Aurora, Colorado. This is the Como 24-hour news center. I'm Greg Hersholt with Manda Factor. People who were leaving a sold-out midnight show of the Dark Knight Rises here in Seattle were, of course, stunned by the news from Colorado. Here's Como's Corwin Haig to begin our team coverage. Here at the Cinerama Theater, smiling fans turned somber as they learned of the deaths and injuries at a screening very much like this one. It just blows my mind to think that that could have been us in that position almost. Accustomed to on-screen violence, these fans can hardly believe it happened in real life and so close to home. That's just insane. That's that's something you would think like would come from like a third world country in a way. Like, you know, that just wouldn't happen in America. Seattle fans speculate moviegoers in Colorado may have considered the mayhem, at least at first, a stunt of some kind. Some people probably didn't even take it seriously at first. People, people dressed up tonight, so I mean, like, anybody could have done that. Whatever the case, movie theater security is now under the microscope. In downtown Seattle, Corwin Hake, Como News Radio. And the gun debate has heated back up. Don Myers, the head of security for Fisher Plaza, where our station is, he says little could be done to prevent this type of incident from a security side, as in metal detectors or security guards. But he questions why people are allowed to purchase high-powered weapons like this shooter apparently had. He obviously was carrying high-capacity magazines and using a weapon that gave him the ability to commit this kind of carnage all by himself. Dave Workman with the Second Amendment Foundation says people are always too quick to rush to blaming the guns. We don't really know what kind of firearm was involved. We've got a handgun, a long gun, and an unidentified third weapon. You know, we're jumping out of the gate a little too fast to say that this is some kind of assault weapon thing. Carlene Johnson, Como News Radio. Lakewood Police Chief Brett Farrar lost four of his officers in 2009 when Maurice Clemens opened fire inside a park Parkland Coffee Shop. We continue our team coverage now with Como's Frank Lindsay live. We spoke with Ferrar because he's been through a tragedy like this before. Even so, he calls the news out of Colorado today unbelievable. I do not know what's going on with society at this point. Um, I can't even wrap my brain around it or fathom what those people in that theater went through. And we've seen images this morning of police officers carrying the wounded out of the theater and putting them into their patrol cars. Once you know, you get involved as a police officer in an incident like that. You you know, you just kind of click into your work mode. But I'll tell you what, when it's over, um, it has a heck of an impact on the police officer. And Farrar says his officers today are dealing with a lot more people with mental problems than he did when he was on patrol 25 years ago. Reporting live, Frank Lindsay, Como News Radio. Thanks, Frank. And here's what's coming up on the Como Morning News. Morning, the tragedy in Colorado, but a key step forward in Seattle as it heals from its own mass shooting experience. I'm John Rep. Live. It's now 8:34. Como AAA traffic and weather every 10 minutes on the fours. Mary Whitish, it's wet out there. It sure is, Greg. And we're getting word of a new incident on the on ramp from 145th to southbound I-5. A two car collision reported. Not sure if it's a blocking issue, so State Patrol is headed that way. And the southbound I-5 drive is just really slow, coming from Linwood all the way through downtown Seattle. Earlier problem in the express lanes at the exit to Pike Street cleared off to the shoulder. It sounds like some emergency crews are still there, so those express lanes are still jammed up from Lake City Way. Northbound I-5 approaching Spokane.
Spokane, an earlier stall just cleared from the uh, HOV lane, but just on the other side of the road, right before the exit to Spokane Street, another vehicle slid off the road and landed in the ditch. We also have that same issue in the South Hill area of Puyallup, the on-ramp from Meridian 31st to westbound 512, a car off the road into the ditch. Emergency crews just now arriving, not blocking any lanes. Oh, back to Lake Washington, we have a new stall, westbound 520. Just as you approach the west high-rise, it's blocking the right-hand lane traffic quickly jamming up from the east high-rise. Westbound I-90 might help you some, although it is slow as you go through the Mercer Island lid over to I-5. And we're also getting word that their flammable cargo restrictions has been in place or just put in place in the tunnels on I-90 either direction. I'm Mary Whitish in the Como AAA Traffic Center. And a look at the weather as you head into the weekend. Here's Shannon O'Donnell. Showers and thunder showers for the Friday morning commute. Some of the downpours will be locally heavy, so some tough commuting for some of us this morning. Temperatures starting out near 60 degrees, if not warmer, so a rather warm start. We'll see fewer showers, more sun breaks as we quiet down later this Friday afternoon with high temperatures on either side of 70. I'm meteorologist Shannon O'Donnell with the Como 4 forecast team. We have some rain around this morning. It is 60 in downtown Seattle. New information just into the Como News Center from the shootings in Colorado. The Pentagon is now saying some members of the military were either killed or wounded in that movie theater shooting in Aurora. It's not clear how many military casualties there were or specifically whether they were killed or injured, but the initial indications are that the suspect in the shooting was not a member of the military. Today's tragedy in Aurora, Colorado comes the same day Cafe Racer reopens. That is where Ian Stowicki killed four people before eventually taking his own life. That was May 30th of this year. It has been an absolutely shocking day of violence in Seattle. The individual involved in the shooting in the 5900 block of Roosevelt and the site of that shooting just seven weeks ago, ironically, is reopening this morning. It's open now for the first time, and Como's John Rep is there to say the first customers are walking through the doors. A lot of people, of course, have the Colorado tragedy on their minds today as they gather here in this Roosevelt neighborhood at Cafe Racer to quietly celebrate a step forward in what many say is a slow recovery process. And I think that it's healing not only for the owners, but for the community. Pretty much everybody is you know, coming together and moving forward. And I think that we'll see a lot of folks. Very positive and very excited for them. The flowers that were once here have long disappeared. The faint outlines of a memorial message on the window are still visible. The cafe business is quiet right now, but one customer this morning tells me the return of this business is all about community support, and that's why she's here right now. Reporting live, John Rep, Como News Radio. We got word just a bit ago that President Obama cut short his campaign rally in Florida because of the shooting in Colorado. I had a chance to speak with the mayor of Aurora as well as the governor of Colorado uh, to express, not just on behalf of Michelle and myself, but uh, the entire American family. Uh, how heartbroken we are. President Obama told his supporters this is not a day for campaigning. It's a day for, day for prayer and reflection. One of the first things we learned after the shootings was that more than 100 FBI agents immediately were dispatched to that movie theater scene quickly to assist local police. More insights on this from ABC News consultant and former FBI agent Brad Garrett. Well, they can help immensely because, first of all, it's added manpower. If there are any immediate leads that need to be tracked down that are not in the Denver Aurora area, they can get them done by just picking up the phone. Uh, They also could offer expertise if there are explosives. Uh, They have weapons experts. They may may have some, uh, they can refer to them if they need to. Uh, And the FBI, from a behavioral standpoint, have profiled shooters like this for a lot of years. And so they can offer perhaps some insight into what is really going on here from the uh, Are there other people? Is this maybe perhaps just one person? Uh, They could also help from the standpoint of, because they have that kind of knowledge, suggestions on how to interview him. All right, on profiling, what kind of person might this be? Uh, You know, this guy, my guess is, is going to fit. He's angry. He is someone who uh, believes that he has the right to do what he has done, that he has been, in his mind, wronged by... uh, Either, I'll be surprised if it's the theater itself, uh, but that he's been wronged by somebody and that there's some symbolic connection to the Batman movie. Ah, Uh, In fact, there was even a suggestion earlier, was he even dressed like Batman? 
Uh, that will be interesting if that's true. ABC's Brad Garrett, a former FBI agent. We also learned as this story has evolved this morning that the suspect in the case, he's an American man. He's a 24-year-old man, originally apparently from Southern California, was a medical student up until about last week when he dropped out of medical school. Stay tuned to Como News Radio for the very latest developments on this shooting at the theater in Colorado. Como News Time now, 840. <laughs> It's the time we check sports and the big sports story around the Puget Sound area from the infinity of Kirkland Sports Desk. Tom Glasgow with all the things people were saying about the arena proposal. Lots of testimony last night. So much my laptop could not uh, last. I had the battery fully charged. But they went on for more than three hours last night down at City Hall. City and county councils meeting jointly uh, on a very rare occasion. That does not happen often. Of course, the topic, the proposal, Chris Hansen's, to build an NBA arena in Soto certainly popular with quite a few folks who were on hand last night. There's some diehard Sonics fans that are just, we're empty. Like, there's two years I did not follow basketball. Others, though, saying it's not worth the cost. If it's going to mean losing my job and my livelihood, I'm definitely against it. A vote from the councils on the proposal expected in August. An overflow crowd, more than 500 turning out last night. Three games for the Mariners coming up in Tampa. They'll get it going tonight with Hisashi Iwakuma on the mound as the M's are coming off a very successful series in Kansas City where they took three out of four games. British Open round two underway and your leader he's completed his second round Brant Snedeker 10 under after excuse me a six under 64 today. That is the same score that Adam Scott shot yesterday to hold the first round lead. Scott two under through 11 on his second round he's just two strokes off the pace at eight under alone in third place tiger woods five under par he is through seven holes on his second round sports at 10 40 past the hour i'm tom glasgow what are people thinking as they line up to see the most talked about movie of the week after the deadly gunfire in colorado we're going to talk about that we're also going to hear the 911 calls coming up. Bit of a challenge on the roads, too, thanks to the weather. A check on both those coming up. It's 842. It's 845. We're going to get to traffic in just a moment. First, uh, some developing news, and Frank Lindsay's here. We're getting reports of a police officer hurt at Sumner High School. Not sure exactly how badly this officer was hurt or what happened. The initial report was that there may have been a lightning strike involved. A doctor, the chief with East Pierce Fire and Rescue, says he doesn't know about that aspect of it. He's checking that out, but what he did tell me was that they did have a lightning strike, at least one in the Bonnie Lake area. So they're trying to figure out exactly what happened to this officer who was hurt this morning at Sumner High. As soon as we find out, we'll bring you those details here on Como News Radio. Como AAA traffic and weather every 10 minutes on the fours. Here's Mary Whitish. And also in that Sumner area, eastbound Sierra 410 at Traffic Avenue is where we had a report of uh, standing water in both lanes, so be careful until they can get the, the drains cleared there. They were on ramp from Meridian and 31st to eastbound 512. We saw a collision with a vehicle that went off the road and into the ditch. I believe emergency crews are on scene partially blocking that on ramp. Getting word of a new crash on westbound I-90 ramp to northbound 405 blocking the right hand lane. Still dealing with uh, issues on southbound I-5 in the express lanes at the uh, exit to Pike Street. That ramp still partially blocked by a tow truck on scene trying to clear vehicles. The express lane stalled from right about Lake City Way. Main line will not help. It is a miserable drive from Linwood all the way through downtown Seattle. Also, uh, watch out for a collision on, in that route on the 145th on ramp to South 5. Looks like they're partially blocking. I'm Mary Whitish in the Como AAA Traffic Center. The weather has been wild. As Frank Lindsay was just mentioned, we've had quite a few lightning strikes as these thunderstorms roll through. This will all taper off in the afternoon. Our high 70. A mix of sunshine and showers for the weekend. A highs around 72. Right now, raining and 60 downtown. Team coverage of the mass shootings in Aurora, Colorado on Como News Radio and ComoNews.com. Good morning. I'm Greg Hershold with Manda Factor. And as the story evolves of the gunman with the gas mask on opening fire in a movie theater in Denver, as the Batman movie was shown to a packed theater, now we're hearing the terror in people's voices in their 911 calls. Well, the first showing of The Dark Knight Rises at Federal Way Century Theaters is just about to begin. You've got to wonder how people are feeling as they're lining up for the 855 show this morning and after they've heard what happened in Colorado. Let's go live to Como's Carlene Johnson. 
And so far, every person I talked to, without exception in this line, says what happened in Colorado. Yes, they had heard about it, but no way was it going to change their plans this morning. This woman came here with her two young grandsons. No, I'm not worried. I don't think anybody will be opening any exit doors after that, emergency exit doors after that. She's referring, of course, to the way we've heard that the gunman in Colorado got in through that exit door down by the screen. That a young woman in line, 25 years old, told me, you can't stop living when things like this happen. Then they win. If we let them dictate that we're not going to go to the movie because we're afraid they're going to come in and shoot it up, they win. A lot of people here with young kids. I've seen some kids here as young as five, six, seven years old in this line. A lot of people said they came to the early show because it's a few bucks off, six bucks for the 855 Dark Night here in Federal Way. Reporting live, Carlene Johnson, Como News Radio. Well, every Friday at this time, we have our chat with Brian, the movie guy, who had a few thoughts about the movie and about what happened at that theater in Colorado. Oh, it's very violent. I mean, the whole series has kind of been built on that, kind of grounding the Dark Knight, Batman, that character in a, in a, in a real-world atmosphere. So it plays out more like a crime thriller than just a, a fluffy, colorful comic book movie. So it's kind of, it kind of hinges, everything hinges on that violence within the film. People have been waiting for months for the release of this movie. A huge deal. It was expected to be, what, I think the third biggest box office opening ever? Yeah, yeah, somewhere in there. I mean, Do you think that'll change now? You know what? I don't think so. I, it, it, this is awful. It's an awful tragedy. I'm in a movie theater at least two times a week, you know, and I could see where being in a movie like that, where it's loud and violent and there's explosions and something like like the, what happened last night happens uh, where you can get disoriented. I mean, it's not like they're watching Sense and Sensibility. They're already in the midst of all that uh, uh, mayhem. And then something like that happens. It's crazy. But I don't I, you know, I don't think this is going to hurt it. I think people we're resilient. We'll go, you know, we'll go on. It's like, you know, people didn't stop going to the Olympics after the Atlanta bombing. Uh, people are still going to Cafe Racer. Uh, you know, people are still going to Virginia Tech. I mean, it's, you know, we'll, we'll continue to go to the movies. When it's something this big, we're just going to not sit at home. So. I've got I to gotta think, though, that people are ha- going to have this on their mind as oh, they sure, walk into a movie sure, theater yeah. from now on. Yeah. Especially when, again, you're in the mayhem of the film. You know, you're, you're going to probably, after this, you're going to be thinking... Watching your back. I don't know. I do know there was a huge red carpet premiere planned in Paris tonight. That's been canceled, and I wouldn't be surprised to hear of more of those events that are canceled today. I would think Warner Brothers is going to be kind of all over this and and very careful with how they proceed with everything. So So I just have to ask you, because there are a lot of people that are planning to go see this movie this Mm -hmm. weekend. Is it good? It's uh, it is a uh, <laughs> it is a triumphant multi layered masterpiece. I'm going to give it an A plus. I don't just hand those out, uh, you know. And I know it's weird to talk about the movie now that this has happened, but if you are going to go to it, you're going to be pleased. I had a wonderful time. It, I think it makes the whole trilogy of these Batman films one of the best uh, trilogies in motion picture history. It's great. I think we have to leave it there. But if people want more of your reviews, BrianTheMovieGuy.com. Brian the Movie Guy, thanks. It's eight fifty one. We want to go right to our Como news line right now. We are getting uh, first uh, eyewitness accounts of what happened in that theater in Colorado. We have a woman. Uh, I, we were just given your name. Is it Andrea Grober? It's Angela Groover. Angela Groover. I'm sorry for that. Tell me what you experienced. Were you in that movie theater complex when this happened? I was in the complex. I was actually two screens down when the shooting happened. I wasn't watching that movie, but we were going to go to that movie. The only reason why I didn't go to that movie is because I had to work the next morning. What are your thoughts this morning now that you you know what happened? Clearly the whole complex was evacuated. Right. It was, um, it was just a very strange uh, incident because we were watching the movie and it's like every one of the theaters had um, like a shooting scene. And then right when the shooting scene, it was like 10 minutes, um, you know, 10 minutes left in the movie, the best part, and then all of a sudden we hear a pop, 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 and we thought it was just the movie, but it wasn't the movie. It was actual shootings, like two screens down, and the bullets, like, came through the, um, you know, the dividers. So it was just, it was just very weird. And then as soon as you got outside, it was just, like, mass chaos. I mean, there are people on the floor. Um, there were just people screaming out, oh, my God, they killed my friend. And, I mean, to hear that, it was just, I mean, it was devastating. I, like, my, thank God my friend was there because he grabbed my hand and he was like, we got to go. We Angela, go did, now. Angela, did they come into the theater and tell you something had happened or did you just all spontaneously get out of there? No, it was so, like, like I said, it was so strange. It was like, um, we heard pops and, again, we thought it was the movie, but all of a sudden, like, three seconds later after the pops started, 
it was an alarm and it was like, uh, please evacuate to the nearest exit. And it just kept saying, you know, there's been an incident. There's been an incident. Please evacuate to the nearest exit. So we walked out the exit and walked right past the theaters where the shootings were just at. Oh, my gosh. We're so grateful for you spending some time to tell us your part of this experience. Angela Grover with us from Aurora, Colorado. She was two screens, two movie theaters away when this gunfire broke out. Again, 12 people killed, dozens injured. Stay tuned to Como News Radio for the very latest as this unfolds. It's 8.53. We'll get to your traffic and weather next. Como AAA traffic and weather every 10 minutes on the fours. Mary Whitish has her eyes on the morning mess. Amanda, we have a crash westbound I-90. The exit ramp to northbound 405 right lane is blocked and quite a bit of a jam up starting in the East Gate area. Also, there's working with the earlier problem southbound I-5 in the express lanes exit to Pike Street now completely cleared finally, but you're still going to be slow on both the main line and the express lanes getting into downtown. And now we have a new problem. Seattle police and fire units on scene of an injury crash southbound on Elliott Avenue at West Lee Street. So just south of the crash that we had earlier this week near the Magnolia Bridge, south of the Magnolia Bridge, blocking the right lane and the left lane and the center turn lane, so just the center lane getting through. This report brought to you by Washington Energy Services. I'm Mary Whitish in the Como AAA Traffic Center. We're expecting the thunder showers and the rain to decrease this afternoon, a high near 70 degrees, but probably still mostly cloudy. Consumer Tip of the Day is brought to you by BECU, a not-for-profit credit union open to everyone who lives in Washington State. Check them out at BECU.org. Here's her. Home prices around the country are going up, but according to Trulia.com, the turnaround here is a little slower. Prices are down about a half percent. That's the average list price in Seattle from where they were about a year ago. But Michael Corbett, Trulia's real estate expert, says that's not really bad news. We were seeing double-digit decreases in pricing, and we're not as much anymore. So there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And look at the cost of borrowing money. Mortgage rates are down again to new historic lows. Mortgage buyer Freddie Mac says the average rate on the 30-year fixed loan is now 3.5%. That's down from 3.56% last week and the lowest since long-term mortgages began in the 1950s. Let's buy, and let's buy safe, sane, and smart. Let's buy something that you can afford. What a concept. The average rate for the 15-year mortgage, popular for refinancing, fell to 2.83%. More on our website, comonews.com. Herb Weisbaum, Como News Radio. Coming up at the top of the hour, stay with us. ABC News has the latest information emerging on the movie theater shooting in Colorado. Fisher Communications, KOMO Seattle, KOMO FM, Oakville. What happens next? 